There are many times when we come to differences of view on various subjects in the scriptures. One of those subjects that we have before us is the issue of the communion service. Over the years, the issue has come whether we are to have open communion or a closed communion. Whenever we come to a point of difference in our belief, we need to understand that there is only one place that we need to consult to find us out whether we should believe one way or another way. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. If you want to know what doctrine you should believe or what doctrine you should teach, the consultation we should have is the Word of God. What does the Bible say? We need to put away our personal opinions. We need to put away our personal viewpoints our feelings, our impressions, and our emotions. Oftentimes, emotions would lead us to believe one thing, but brethren, unless we put away all of that and base everything on the written Word of God, we're not going to find a clear path to the Kingdom of God. The Bible is clear. It doesn't need the emotions to cloudy up our mind. But it's important to know how we are to search those scriptures because oftentimes, even when we get together, we study the Bible, we still come up with wrong or contrary viewpoints. How do we come to study the scriptures? An important statement is found in Testaments and Ministers, page 107 to 109. Testaments and Ministers, 107 to 109 says we should come with reverence to the study of the Bible, feeling that we are in the presence of God. All lightness and trifling should be laid aside. While some portions of the word are easily understood, the true meaning of other parts is not so readily discerned. There must be patient study and meditation and earnest prayer. Every student as he opens the scriptures should ask for the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and the promise is sure that it will be given. The spirit in which you come, notice this, the spirit in which you come to the investigation of the scriptures will determine the character of the assistant at your side. Whose, which assistance do you want? Do you want the assistance from God or do you want the assistance from Satan? Well, it says here, the spirit in which you come to the investigation of the scriptures will determine the character of the assistant at your side. Angels from the world of light will be with those who in humility of heart seek for divine guidance. But if the Bible is opened with irreverence, with a feeling of self-sufficiency, if the heart is filled with prejudice, Satan is beside you and he will set the plain statements of God's word in a perverted light. There are many things as we are studying the word of God. We study with somebody else and we find they cannot understand it. Why is that so? It is simply because they have a different spirit. When we have a different spirit, we can never come to the same conclusion. It is only as the Spirit of God leads us that we are able to have the same conclusions. There are some who indulge in levity and sarcasm and even mockery towards those who differ with them. Others present an array of objections to any new view. And when these objections are plainly answered by the word of Scripture, they do not acknowledge the evidence as presented nor allow themselves to be convinced. Their questioning is not for the purpose of arriving at truth, but is intended merely to confuse the minds of others. Some have thought in evidence of intellectual keenness and superiority to perplex minds in regard to what is truth. They resort to subtlety of argument, to playing upon words. They take unjust advantage in asking questions. When their questions have been fairly answered, they will turn the subject and bring up another point to avoid acknowledging the truth. 
we should beware of indulging the spirit which controlled the Jews. They would not learn of Christ because his explanation of the scriptures did not agree with their ideas. Therefore they became spies upon his track, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Let us not bring upon ourselves the fearful denunciation of the Savior's words. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of the knowledge. Ye have entered not yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. It does not require much learning or ability to ask questions that are difficult to answer. A child may ask questions over which the wisest men may be puzzled. Let us not engage in a contest of this kind. The very same unbelief exists in our time as prevailed in the days of Christ. Now, as then, the desire for preferment and praise of men leads people away from the simplicity of true godliness. There is no pride so dangerous as spiritual pride. So we find here that anyone can ask questions that no one can answer. That's quite easy to do. We have, when we come to the searching of scriptures, we need not seek those type of questions. We need to seek to understand the will of God. We need to come with the right attitude to learn the will of God for us. And the same thing comes on this subject of the Lord's Supper. We need to put away our personal prejudices and our personal feelings. And we need to take a plain, thus saith the Lord, to understand what is right and what is wrong. I am not going to go through the historical approach. The historical position of Adventism has always been closed communion. The Seventh-day Adventist Church did not introduce open communion until some time after Sister White's death to the best of my ability to decipher. In an article published by J. H. Wagner, in 1886 as a stand of Seventh-day Adventists. It was in a booklet entitled The Church, Its Organization and Its Order. He makes very clearly, he devotes two chapters to clearly explaining why the church took a position of close communion. Also there were a few articles in the Signs of the Times that explained this position. We are not going to spend that time here to understand those historical positions. You can search those things out on your own. I want us to study more importantly the biblical view and then the spirit of prophecy view on this subject. In the first place, to understand the significance of the Lord's Supper, we need to understand the meaning of the Lord's Supper in its type. Now the type is something a symbol of something that was to take place in the future. But to understand that, let us look at first of all, what is the Lord's Supper a memorial of? Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So when we're talking about the Lord's Supper service, what it does, it always points back as a memorial to something. It says, to show the Lord's death until He comes. So until the coming of Christ, we, when we participate in the Lord's Supper service, we are pointing back to Calvary and remembering the experiences that took place there on the cross. Now, what service in the Old Testament pointed forward to this same event? What service in the Old Testament specifically pointed forward to this event? We look in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 539. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 539. On the 14th day of the month at even, the Passover was celebrated. Its solemn impressive ceremonies, commemorating the deliverance from bondage in Egypt and pointing forward to the sacrifice that should deliver from the bondage of sin. When the Savior yielded up His life on Calvary, the significance of the Passover ceased and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper was instituted as a memorial of the same event of which the Passover had been a type. So what happened on Calvary? The significance of the Passover ceased. 
if we still want to keep the Passover today, we do not recognize Calvary because that significance of the cross, Passover ceased on Calvary. So from the time that the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt, the Passover service pointed forward to Calvary. It pointed forward to the crucifixion of Christ. It pointed forward in such a direct way that it mentioned that the Passover had to be kept on the 14th day of the first month at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It is very important to note that when Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross, it was the 14th day of the first month at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so at that moment, the significance of the Passover ceased. So we find here that this service pointed forward to the cross, and from the cross, the Lord's Supper took its place. Now, let us take a look at some important principles that were to take place in the Passover service. And since we are talking here about who can participate and who cannot participate, I want to emphasize that aspect of the service, not the other aspects. You remember that bef that night of the Passover in Exodus chapter 12, that very evening the death angel was going to go to the land and he was going to kill all the firstborn of the Egyptians. And the only way that someone could be safe, there were several things that they had to do. They had to place the blood on the doorpost and the side post of their house. But not only that, what about an Egyptian? It was not enough to put blood on the doorpost and side post of the house if you're an Egyptian. Something else had to take place. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 279, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 279, we find this way, As Moses rehearsed to Israel the provisions of God for their deliverance, the people bowed the head and worshipped, the glad hope of freedom, the awful knowledge of the impending judgment upon their oppressors, the cares and labors incident to their speedy departure, all were for a time swallowed up in gratitude to their gracious deliverer. Many of the Egyptians had been led to acknowledge the God of the Hebrews as the only true God. And these now begged to be permitted to find shelter in the homes of Israel when the destroying angel should pass through the land. They were gladly welcomed and they pledged themselves henceforth to serve the God of Jacob and to go forth from Egypt with his people. In that particular experience, as the death angel was about to go to the land, there were many Egyptians who decided to do what? They decided to find shelter. So to find shelter, what did they have to do? What was required of them in order to have shelter? Number one, they had to leave Egyptian homes and come where? And come to the Hebrew home. So they had to come to the Hebrew homes. It was not enough just to stay where they're at. They had to come to the Hebrew home, to the Hebrew home that had the blood. So the blood had to be on the Hebrew home and they had to come to that home. And now they came there and they begged to find shelter and they were gladly welcomed. Now notice here it says, many of the Egyptians had been led to acknowledge the God of the Hebrews. So what did they do? Why did they leave their, their homes? Because they acknowledged the God of the Hebrews. So they acknowledged the God of the Hebrews. They recognized Him as the true God and the only true God. Notice here it was the only true, true God. So these Egyptians, when they came to find shelter, they acknowledged the God of the Hebrews as the only true God, and they begged to be permitted to find shelter in the homes of Israel when the destroying angel should pass through the land. They were gladly welcomed, and what else did they do? They pledged themselves from henceforth to serve the God of Jacob. So from now on, 
they promised to serve the true God, the God of Jacob. They promised to serve the God of Jacob. And then what else it says here? And to go forth from Egypt with his people. So I number four, to leave Egypt. Not only were they going to come to the Hebrew home for shelter, but they also were going to leave Egypt. Now, I would like to know what was the difference between the belief of these Egyptians and the Hebrews. What was the difference in their belief? Let's take a look. First of all, they were in the same home. That's right. They were not in the Egyptian homes. They were in the home of the Hebrews. So they were even in the same home. They acknowledged the God of the Hebrews as the only true God. What God did the Hebrews acknowledge? Well, the same God. So they recognized the same God. From now on, they promised to serve whom? They promised to serve that God. The Hebrews themselves, many of them were not serving that God up till now. And now they also, even the Hebrews now, promised to serve the same God. And what else did these Egyptians do? They promised to leave Egypt together with the Hebrews. So now what was the difference in their belief? There was none. They had the same belief. The same belief was held by these Egyptians as well as by the Hebrews. Now that night, as the destroying angel was about to pass over, the Hebrews came together and they ate the Passover. Could these Egyptians, with exactly the same belief, exactly the same practices, could they eat the Passover lamb? Let's take a look. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verse 43 to 49. Exodus 12, 43 to 49. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. What? No stranger is going to eat that Passover lamb. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So a person here, unless this Egyptian was circumcised, he could not eat the Passover lamb. It was unacceptable. Now, if he decided to be circumcised that evening, it was impossible too, because they were getting ready to leave Egypt. And you remember what happened with the Shechemites. They, three days later, they couldn't walk anywhere. They couldn't defend themselves. And so, unless these Egyptians had already made this decision earlier and were circumcised earlier, they were not able to participate in the Passover, even though they believed the same belief. Now I have a question. They believed the same belief, but they could not eat Passover lamb. Were they safe that night? Did they, were they saved from the destroying angel? Yes, they were. If, if what? If they were in the Hebrew home. You see, if they wandered outside the Hebrew home, there's no safety. They had to be in the Hebrew home in order to have the safety. So even though they could not participate in the Passover, they were still saved because they were in that Hebrew home. Now what do we mean when we say circumcision? They had to be circumcised. Why was circumcision given? Let's look at Genesis chapter 17. 
Genesis chapter 17 verses 1 and 2 and 7 through 11. Genesis 17, 1 and 2 and 7 through 11. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And verse 7 through 11, and I will establish my covenant betwixt me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of their foreskin. It shall be a token of a covenant between, betwixt me and you. So circumcision here was a symbol of the covenant that God had made together with Abraham. In this covenant that he made between Abraham and his children, it says, number one, be thou perfect. So this covenant, when we're talking about circumcision, when we're talking about circumcision, in the first place in that chapter, it begins with, be thou perfect. It was a pledge on the part of Abraham that through the power of God, because remember he was justified by faith, that through the power of God, he is going to obey God perfectly. In the book, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 262 to 263, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, 262 to 263, it says, he then required of Abraham and his seed circumcision, which was a circle cut in the flesh, as a token that God had cut them out and separated them from all nations as his peculiar treasure. So notice here, what's another reason for circumcision? It says here, the second point, he was separated from all nations. So it says here that Abraham and his seed, the circumcision was a sign that they are going to be separated from all other nations. By this sign they solemnly pledge themselves that they would not intermarry with other nations. For by so doing they would lose their reverence from God and His holy law and would become like the idolatrous nations around them. So what's another point here? They would not intermarry. They would not intermarry with the other nations. These, this were the meaning of circumcision. By the act of circumcision, they solemnly agreed to fulfill on their part the conditions of the covenant made with Abraham to be separate from all nations and to be perfect. And then it goes on down and says that they would have kept these conditions. They would never have gone down into Egyptian slavery. So circumcision meant those things. It meant that they were going to be perfect. They're going to perfectly obey the law of God through the power that He's given them. They're going to be separated from other nations and they are not going to intermarry with the other nations. What has taken the place of circumcision in the, New, in the New Testament? Because circumcision is no longer valid. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. So here it mentions that we are circumcised in the heart in Jesus Christ. How? And the sentence continues on. Notice it's one sentence there. It says, buried with Him in baptism. So when we are buried in Him in baptism, it means that we have been circumcised in that true circumcision that God accepts. So now, so baptism here has taken the place of circumcision. For this reason, in volume 6, page 91, 
volume 6, Testament for the Church, page 91, it talks about the meaning of baptism. It says here, Christ has made baptism the sign of entrance to His spiritual kingdom. He has made this a positive condition with which all must comply who wish to be acknowledged as under the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before man can find a home in the church, before passing the threshold of God's spiritual kingdom, he is to receive the impress of the divine name, the Lord, our righteousness. Baptism is a most solemn renunciation of the world. So when we're dealing here with baptism, it is number one, most solemn renunciation of the world. So baptism is the most solemn renunciation of the world. Those who are baptized in the threefold name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, at the very entrance of their Christian life, declare publicly that they have forsaken the service of Satan and have become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly King. They have obeyed the command, come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. So we find here that clearly baptism is the, most, is the same as separation from all nations. And what does it mean, all nations? What does it mean, nations, in the New Testament? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. So when the apostle is writing to the church of God, he writes to them as a holy nation. For this same reason, when we're talking here about separated from all other nations, we are talking, not talking about that we are not to intermarry with someone who is a different nationality. No, we're talking here about separate from all other churches. In the days of Hebrew people, the nations were the churches. So we find here that this is the most solemn renunciation of the world. It is a separation. from all churches, all other churches. So, when we are baptized, it means that we are not only going to be just baptized and we've accepted Jesus, but the acceptance of Jesus means that we only have Him as our one soul Loyalty to. That means the most solemn renunciation of the world, separation from all other churches. And the same thing also goes. We do not intermarry with the others. When we are baptized, what are we baptized into? Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. Galatians 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we're baptized into whom? Into Christ. What does that mean? 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Notice here that by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Now, when we are baptized into Christ, we are not baptized directly into the head. We are baptized into the head through the body, as we studied in our last lesson. This body is, what is this body? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians 1. 22 and 23, and had put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So here it says that we are baptized when the body is the church. And when we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his body, which is his church. This church is a visible, organized church as we've studied. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 15 through 17. 
1 Corinthians 10, verses 15 through 17. And this here is giving the illustration of the Lord's Supper. It says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? When we gather together for the Lord's Supper, and we break that bread together, what does that mean? When we partake of that bread, it says that we partake of the body of Christ. What did we just learn is the body of Christ? That body of Christ is His church. Therefore, we must be part of that church in order to, par to partake of that bread. You may think I'm stretching this, but notice the next verse, verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So this verse makes it very clear that yes, this is what we are talking about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 leaves us with a very important question. It says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And I have a question for you. What communion does have light have with darkness? If we believe somebody is in darkness, can we have communion with them? Can we have Lord's Supper with those who we believe are in darkness and error? It is not enough to be baptized. We must be separated from the world and joined to His body. Let's look at an important experience in the Passover service in Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. Verses 19 to 22. Ezra 6, 19 to 22, it says, And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the fourteenth day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity and for their brethren the priests and for themselves. And the children of Israel, which were come again out of captivity, and all such as had separated themselves unto them, from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat. Notice here, what was it? They had, in order, it was not just to be circumcised, they had to have separated themselves from the filthiness of the heathen and their dwat, and had joined together themselves together with the Israelites. That's what it takes in order to have the Passover. Now when we talk about the early Christian church, did the early Christian church practice open communion or closed communion? Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 through 20. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Now, he was writing this letter to one church, the church in Corinth. And he says that as he was writing to the church in Corinth, he found out that there are divisions among that church. One same local church. There were divisions among them. And these divisions, what kind of divisions were these? It says in verse 19, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So what was going on in that church? There were divisions, and these divisions involved what? They involved heresies. Be and what is a heresy? Heresies are false teachings. So they had divergent teachings in the church in Corinth. Because they had divergent teachings, notice verse 20. When you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Notice the marginal reading for that that explains exactly what this means. It says, when you come together therefore into one place, you cannot eat the Lord's Supper. So why could they not eat the Lord's Supper? Because they had different doctrinal beliefs. And until they came to the unity of the faith, they were not able to have Lord's Supper together. And this is speaking about even of a local, same local church. What about if it's a different denominations as we have it today? 
unless we have the unity of belief, we cannot have the Lord's Supper together. What about a person that is known to be an open sin? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5, let's read verses 7 through 13. First Corinthians 5, 7 through 13. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for them must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company with any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one no, not to eat. What does it mean, with such an one no, not to eat? Are we not to have lunch together with someone like this? In the context here, it was talking here about the unleavened bread, about Christ being the Passover for us. And being in the New Testament, they are now in the Lord's Supper experience. And that means then that we are not to have Lord's Supper together with such a person. We'll see this a little bit later on as we go into the spirit of prophecy. So in order for us to partake of the Lord's Supper together, we must have the same belief. And not only so, we must also be of the same body. Notice again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So when we're talking about the Lord's Supper, when we partake of that bread, we must be one body. So now, what happens if you are partaking of the Lord's Supper, bread with some other body of believers? It means you are one with them. That's what it means. Now, among the early Seventh-day Adventists, what position did they take? in regards to the Lord's Supper. Let us take a look at a couple of statements. First of all, Volume 1, Present Truth, number 11, November 1850. Volume 1, Present Truth, number 11, 1850. You'll find it in the big Review and Herald articles, the very first couple of pages there. It says, Then I was pointed back to the time that Jesus took His disciples away alone into an upper room and first washed their feet and then gave them to eat of the broken bread to represent his broken body and juice of the vine to represent his spilled blood. I saw that all should move understandingly and follow the example of Jesus in these things and when attending to these ordinances should be as separate from unbelievers as possible. What does it say here? When we are attending the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, what are we to be doing? In the early Adventist church, 1850, they were to be as separate from unbelievers as possible. In volume 6, page 91, volume 6, page 91, establishes an important principle. The ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars, one without and one within the church. You have two monumental pillars. You have one here is called baptism. The other pillar is called Lord's Supper. And what did it say? It says one is without and one is within the church. Which one is without? Is Lord's Supper outside the church or is it inside the church? In this context, it says... Let me read it again, volume 6, page 91. The ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars, one without and one within the church. 
So to those who have the Lord's Supper, they are to be inside the church in order to receive the Lord's Supper. It is interesting the relationship that we are to have with other denominations. Early Writings, page 124 and 125. Early Writings, 124, 125, it says, The different parties of professed Advent believers have each a little truth, but God has given all these truths to His children who are being prepared for the day of God. He has also given them truths that none of these parties know, neither will they understand. Things which are sealed up to them, the Lord has opened to those who will see and are ready to understand. If God has any new light to communicate, He will let His chosen and beloved understand it without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness and error. I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we are having the last message of mercy being separate from those who are daily imbibing new errors. To be what? To be separate from those who are doing what? daily imbibing new errors. I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings, for it is wrong to thus encourage them while they teach error that is a deadly poison to the soul, and teach for doctrines the commandments of men. The influence of such gatherings is not good. If God has delivered us from such darkness and error, we should stand fast in the liberty wherewith He has set us free and rejoice in the truth. God is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go. For unless He sends us to those meetings where error is forced home to the people by the power of the will, He will not keep us. The angels cease their watchful care over us and we are left to the buffetings of the enemy to be darkened and weakened by Him and the power of His evil angels and the light around us is contaminated with the darkness. So, according to this passage, what are we to do? We are to be as separate from unbelievers as possible. We are not to attend the meetings of those who are daily imbibing new errors. So if we cannot attend their meetings, can we have Lord's Supper together? I have a question. Which is the most sacred institution in the church? Attending a church meeting or the Lord's Supper? Attending a business meeting or a Lord's Supper? I remember some years ago, someone was really upset because an emissary from the Archdiocese of Indianapolis addressed the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists held there in that year. They said, how terrible it is. At the same time, that person was believing that we should have open communion with anyone who professes to be a Christian. And I simply have to ask the question, what was wrong with that man speaking in the congregation if you would have no problem having Lord's Supper with him? If I can have Lord's Supper with him, surely I can listen to him speak. But here what are we told? We're to be separate from those who are daily imbibing new error. We are not even to attend their meeting, much less have them speak to us. It is interesting that this whole issue of open communion unfortunately began with John Bunyan. John Bunyan had many truths to share. Uh, you remember the story of Pilgrim's Progress. But one of the things that he did introduce was open communion. He was an Anabaptist, and as he entered, introduced Open Communion, he had all the different people around the area, whoever wanted to, came and had Lord's Supper. Well, after he died, another Baptist group not too far away, they came to the business meeting of the church that he used to pastor. Can you imagine that? They came to the business meeting. And why not? If they could have Lord's Supper together, surely they can come to the business meeting. And not only to be present in the business meeting, but to vote because the Lord's Supper is more sacred than voting in the business meeting. And what they did, they made sure they brought enough of their friends and they voted in a new pastor. They voted one of their own pastor. And for the next hundred years, that Anabaptist church did not have an Anabaptist pastor. They had somebody else because of their false views on the Lord's Supper.
Now, the statements that we read so far seem quite clear. There is one issue, and that is the misuse of the statement in Desire of Ages, page 656, that brings in some confusion. And it would be really good for you if you would go ahead and take the book Desire of Ages and follow along. Because only as you follow along would you be able to understand clearly the misconceptions that are being pressed there. Desire of Ages, page 656. I would like to read the statement in question first, and then we'll go on from there. Desire of Ages, 656. It says, Christ's example forbids exclusiveness at the Lord's Supper. This is the biggest sta part of the statement that people use. Oftentimes, when we read only one sentence, we do not understand exactly what that sentence really ought to mean. Notice this paragraph. Christ's example forbids exclusiveness at the Lord's Supper. But notice the next sentence. It is true that open sin excludes the guilty. So here we find that someone is excluded from the Lord's Supper. Although it says Christ's example forbids exclusiveness in the Lord's Supper, the next sentence already gives some exclusion. It says it is true that open sin excludes the guilty. This the Holy Spirit plainly teaches. Now, where does the Holy Spirit plainly teach that open sin excludes the guilty? If you look there, it gives you a verse. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. Well, let us look at 1 Corinthians 5 and 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. It is that verse that I just mentioned a little while ago. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. So here it says, Christ's example forbids exclusiveness at the Lord's Supper. It is true that open sin excludes the guilty. This the Holy Spirit plainly teaches. 1 Corinthians 5.11 So 1 Corinthians 5.11, it says, Will such an one know not to eat? So the Holy Spirit plainly teaches that those who are in open sin, those who are in open violation of the law of God, they are excluded from the Lord's Supper. They cannot participate in the Lord's Supper. So there is some exclusion. This is the first exclusion mentioned here. We go on. But beyond this, none are to pass judgment. Beyond what? Beyond open sin. God has not left it with men to say, Who shall present themselves on these occasions? For who can read the heart? Keep in mind here, open sin excludes the guilty, but also it says here, Who can read the heart? So, obviously it's talking about here something that is internal. For who can read the heart? Who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? Oh, what do you mean who can read the heart? Who can distinguish tares from the wheat? Who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? We are not going to go in great detail here about the wheat and the tares. We have a separate video on that particular subject. But I would like to read something here from Christ's Object Lessons. What do we mean by wheat and tares? By the way, where do wheat and tares grow? This is an important question. You know, sometimes we don't correlate one statement from another. It says, who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? Well, where are wheat and tares? Are they in everywhere? Let's read in Christ's Object Lessons, page 17. Christ's 
Christ Object Lessons, page 70. The field, Christ said, is the world. But we must understand this as signifying the church of Christ in the world. So we find here that when it says, who can read the heart? When it says, who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? We are talking here, tares from the wheat where? In the church. That's right. We are talking about who can distinguish the tares from the wheat in the church. In this context, we're not even talking outside of the church. We are talking about inside the church. So who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning what? Not discerning the Lord's body. And what is the Lord's body? What have we just been studying about? We've been studying about that the Lord's body is the church. So here again, who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? Where? In the church. Not discerning the Lord's body. Where? What is it? The church. Further on, when believers assemble. Oh, wait a minute. When who assembles? When believers assemble, when believers assemble, who are believers? What do we understand by this term, believers? Who are believers? Believers in what? Volume 5, Testing for the Church. Volume 5, Testing for the Church, page 364, paragraph 1. Volume 5, 364, paragraph 1. What is a believer? When it says, when believers assemble, who are we talking about? Volume 5, 364, paragraph 1. My sister, dare you disregard these plain and positive directions? As a child of God, a subject of Christ's kingdom, the purchase of His blood, how can you connect yourselves with one who does not acknowledge His claims, who is not controlled by His Spirit? The commands I have quoted are not the word of man, but of God. Though the companion of your choice were in all other respects worthy, which he is not, yet he has not accepted the truth for this time. He is an unbeliever. And you are forbidden of heaven to unite with yourself with Him. You cannot with peril to your soul disregard His divine injunction. So what does it mean here? When it says here, when believers assemble, who are these believers according to this statement? Those who accept the truth for this time. If one does not accept the truth for this time, he is an unbeliever. That's right. So, again, in Desire of Ages, the context of what we're talking about here, Desire of Ages, page 656, when believers assemble to celebrate the ordinances, who? Those who have accepted the truth for this time. If someone has not accepted the truth for this time, he is not a believer. He is not included in this passage. We're not talking about those, everybody who says, Jesus. No. When believers assemble, so it's an assembly of those who have accepted the truth for this time. When believers assemble to celebrate the ordinances, there are present messengers unseen by human eyes. There may be a Judas in the company. A who? There may be a Judas 
in the company. And if so, messengers from the Prince of Darkness are there, for they attend all who refuse to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Where is Judas? There may be a Judas in the company. It's another important point for us to meditate on. In the company. There may be a Judas in the company. Heavenly angels are also present. These unseen visitants are present on every such occasion. There may come into the company. Oh. There may what? There may come into the company persons who are not in heart servants of truth and holiness, but who may wish to take part in their service. They should not be forbidden. Notice here, again, who can read the heart? What heart are we talking about? We're talking about the distinction between wheat and the tares. These are in the church. So there may come into the church someone who is not in heart, servant of truth and holiness. These, should, they should not be forbidden. There are witnesses present who were present when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and of Judas. More than human eyes beheld the scene. Again, this whole issue of wheat and the tares needs to be clearly understood. It is interesting also that this whole chapter, in remembrance of me, in this particular context, is always talking here about Judas. There may come a Judas in the company. Now, who was Judas? Who was he? Was Judas Caiaphas? Was he professing heathenism? Was he a member of the Jewish church? Or was he a member of the newly organized church? Let's look at Desire of Ages, page 294. Desire of Ages, page 294. The disciples were anxious that Judas should become one of their number. What did they want? They wanted Judas to be part of one of their number. Page 294, paragraph 3. When Judas joined the disciples, he was not insensible to the beauty and character of Christ, etc. The book Education, page 92 to 93. Education, 92 to 93. Seeing the danger of Judas, he had brought him close to himself within the inner circle of his chosen and trusted disciples. So where was Judas? He was in the inner circle. In volume 4, page 41, I was shown that the fact that Judas was numbered among the twelve with all his faults and defects of character is an instructive lesson, one by the study of which Christians may be profited. He was numbered among the twelve. So Judas was part of their company here. Why did not Jesus dismiss Judas? Volume 5, Bible Commentary, page 1102. Volume 5, Bible Commentary, 1102. Christ knew when He permitted Judas to connect with Him as one of the twelve, one of the twelve, that Judas was possessed of a, the demon of selfishness. He knew that this professed disciple would betray him, and yet he did not separate him from the other disciples and send them away. He was preparing the minds of these men for his death and ascension, and he foresaw that should he dismiss Judas, Satan would use him to spread reports that would be difficult to meet and explain. So Jesus would have had difficulty to meet these reports and explain them if he dismissed G Judas. So he left him there. Page 717, Desire of Ages 717. Judas was highly regarded by the disciples and had great influence over them. So the disciples regarded him highly. Education, page 93. Education, page 93. At the ordination of the twelve, the disciples had greatly desired that Judas should become one of their number, etc. So Judas was ordained. He was an ordained minister. That's who Judas was. 
Again, we must keep in context what we're talking about here when we're talking about Judas as an example to be participating, uh, participate in the Lord's Supper. Of the disciples, there was only 12 of them. That was the headquarters of the early Christian church. What role did Judas have? Not only was he a minister, what else? Page 717, the Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages, 717. Judas was blinded to his own weakness of character, and Christ placed him where he would have an opportunity to see and correct this. As treasurer for the disciples, he was called upon to provide for the needs of the little company, etc. So what was he? He was the treasurer of the church. That's right. He was the treasurer of that little company. He was also many other things, a minister, evangelist, many things that he was responsible for. So when we're talking here about Judas, we're talking clearly about the distinction between the wheat and the tares. Where? In the church. We're not talking about this somewhere else. We're talking about it in the church. We're talking about when believers assemble. These believers are those who accept the truth for this time. If we don't have the same belief, we cannot have the Lord's Supper together. That is impossible. Again, Desire of Ages 656. It says, There may come into the company persons who are not in heart servants of truth and holiness, but who may wish to take part in this service. Well, I've heard many individuals tell me, Oh, this must mean a non-member because they're not in heart servants of truth and holiness. Well, I have a problem with that because of the context of the statement. Let's look down at another paragraph just down below. None should exclude themselves from the communion because some who are unworthy may be present. Some who are unworthy. Who are these unworthy ones? Every disciple is called upon to participate publicly and thus bear witness that he accepts Christ as a personal Savior. It is at these his own appointments that Christ meets his people and energizes them by his presence. So Christ is there to energize us with his presence. And now notice here, hearts and hands that are unworthy may even administer the ordinance. Yet Christ is there to minister to His children. Wait a minute. Hearts and hands that are what? Unworthy may do what? They administer the ordinance. Now I have a question. In the previous paragraph, where it says, There may come into the company persons who are not in heart, servants of truth and holiness, but they may wish to take part in the service. They should not be forbidden. It says, There may even be those who are unworthy may be present. If these who are participants, who are receiving it, are, if these that are hearts, unworthy, if this means non-member, what does this one mean? Those who administer it. If this means non-member, this means non-member. And we cannot admit that non-members are going to administer the ordinances for us. Unless that's what we really choose to believe. But that's not what God says. Who is to superintend these services? Which, who is to do that? Review and Herald, June 22, 1897. Review and Herald, June 22, 1897. These ordinances are regarded too much as a form and not as a sacred thing to call to mind the Lord Jesus. Christ ordained them and delegated His power to His ministers who have the treasure in earthen vessels. They are to superintend these special appointments of the one who established them to continue to the close of time. Who is to administer these ordinances? His ministers. Who are His ministers? This is why it comes back to who is God's church. 
it comes back to who has that authority of Aaron's rod. It is the Aaron's rod ministry that is the one to be leading out in the service. If a person is not part of the Aaron's rod ministry, he has no right to administer these ordinances. So each way we look at it, this is speaking about his church. It is speaking about the people in his church. So when it says here, right from the beginning, Christ's example forbids exclusiveness at the Lord's Supper, in context we are talking about Judas. We're talking about a church member. We're talking about believers, those who have taken their stand with the present truth. If we believe that, oh, wait a minute, oh no, we can have Lord's Supper with anyone who believes the name of Jesus or professes the name of Jesus, then what about marriage? What about marriage? When we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? When it says here, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It says here we are not to marry with unbelievers. If we decide that unbelievers means in the communion sense, means only those who do not profess Jesus, then we must then say that marriage can be made with all those who profess Jesus. We cannot admit that. Unbelievers, as we read in volume 5, is whom? Whoever has not accepted the present truth for our time. We cannot intermarry with those who do not have the present truth. We cannot have Lord's Supper with those who have not accepted the present truth. And what about the second angel's message? What about second angel's message where it says in Revelation chapter 14 verse 8, Revelation 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Tell me something, this second angel's message, did Babylon fall or did it not fall? Is Babylon fallen? Are those churches who have rejected who have rejected the truth for our time can we have Lord's Supper with them? No. And not only this, maybe we find someone that has not rejected the truth for our time. Maybe someone says, well I have accepted all the truth for this time and they want to be part and participate with the Lord's Supper. But the question that is answered here in the Bible is that Lord's Supper is for whom? Let's look at 1 Corinthians again. Let's look at those three verses one more time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 18 through 20. For first of all when you come together in the church I hear that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together therefore into one place, you cannot eat the Lord's Supper, the marginal reading. So, in order for us to have Lord's Supper together, number one, we must have the same belief. We must have the same belief. Number two, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16 and 17. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. So we must be part of one bread. 
This one bread, it says, is the one body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, 27 and 28, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and 28. Now ye are the body of Christ in members in particular. So we must be members of that one body of Christ. That means, that means also an organized body of Christ that we've just been studying. And God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. In that church there is a thing called government. Government is church organization. These things must be present in that church. So this church that we are having Lord's Supper together with, it is the one body of Christ. It is that one body of believers. It's an organized body. And there and only there is the Lord's Supper to be given. Now you may question, oh, but there's one more statement. There's one more statement in the book Evangelism. Let us take a look at that statement in Evangelism. Evangelism, page 276 and 277. You may say, oh, but the statement there, there's an example of that. Evangelism, 276 to 277. It's an experience dealing with a faith, faithfully with an interested minister. It was written in 1893. But before I read that statement, I would like to ask you a question. When we talk about the Lord's Supper, is the foot washing service required? Is it a requirement prior to participating in the actual emblems? Let us look in John chapter 13, verse 8. John chapter 13 and verse 8. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. What did Peter say? You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So Jesus told Judah, Jesus told Peter, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that you have no part with me? Desire of Ages, page 646. Desire of Ages, page 646. It says, The service which Peter refused was the type of a higher cleansing. Christ had come to wash the heart from the stain of sin. In refusing to allow Christ to wash his feet, Peter was refusing the higher cleansing included in the lower. He was really rejecting his Lord. So if someone refuses the foot washing service, what is he doing? He is refusing Jesus. He is refusing the higher cleansing. In Signs of the Times, March 25th, 1860. Signs of the Times, March 25th, 1860. The example of washing the feet of his disciples was given for the benefit of all who should believe in him. He required them to follow his example. What did he do? He required them to follow his example. So this issue of foot washing service, that is a requirement. Matter of fact, in the very last days, the foot washing service identifies God's true children. In Early Writings, page 15, paragraph 1. Early Writings, page 15 and paragraph 1. After the voice of God is given to His church, it says this way, the 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. On their forehead was written God, New Jerusalem, and the glorious star containing Jesus' new name. At our happy holy state, the wicked were enraged and would rush violently up to lay hands on us to thrust us into prison when we would stretch forth the hand in the name of the Lord and they would fall helpless to the ground. Then it was that the synagogue of Satan knew that God had loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the brethren with a holy kiss, and they worshiped at our feet. At whose feet does the synagogue of Satan worship? Those who had washed one another's feet. Again, the statement there in Signs of the Times, I want to read that one again. The example of washing the feet of his disciples was given for the benefit of all who should believe in him. 
He required them to follow his example. So is the foot washing service required or is it an option? It is clearly a requirement. Now in this context, let us read the statement there, the experience in, early, in Evangelism 276. It's a Sabbath morning when the church at such and such a place celebrated the ordinances. Brother, so and so was present. He was invited to unite in the ordinance of feet washing, but he said he preferred to witness it. He asked if participation in this ordinance was required before one could partake of the communion. So what was his first question? Is it required to have the foot washing service? And what did they say? And was assured by our brethren that it was not obligatory and that he would be welcome to the table of the Lord. So what did the brethren tell him? They said that the foot washing service is not required and that you are welcome to the table of the Lord. The Sabbath was the most precious day to his soul. He said that he had never had a happier day in his life. Well, tell me something. Is it required or is it not required? We use, some people use this statement to say, oh, the, uh, it's open communion. But wait a minute. If we use this statement to say it's open communion, then we must also use this statement to say it is not required. And what are we going to do with the statement here in John chapter 13 and this other statement in Signs of the Times? In reality, the spirit of prophecy was carefully writing history. Carefully recording history as it happened. We do not use this statement here to determine a doctrinal position. And why not? Well, for the same reason that we can turn here to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel 25. We recognize this as accurate history. And what does it say here? 1 Samuel 25, verse 42. And Abigail hastened and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. Here it records history. It records history as it happened. That David took multiple wives. Nowhere in this chapter does it record that this was wrong. No, it does not. We uh, find other places in the Bible that identify this as something wrong, but not in this chapter. So we have to find other verses to find out what is the true position, not just what had happened. Rather, in Patriot and Prophets, page 668, it says, He was already the husband of one wife. But the custom of the nations of his time had perverted his judgment and influenced his actions. Even great and good men have erred in following the practices of the world. The bitter result of marrying many wives was sorely felt throughout all the life of David. So prophets write history as they happened. And in this case, we find an accurate statement of what happened in that meeting. But we cannot use this for doctrinal basis because it clearly conflicts with the Bible and other statements in the spirit of prophecy. Actually, the article doesn't even say whether he had communion or not. He just says the brethren invited him. But he didn't say anywhere in that article whether they did or didn't. But that's beside the point. The fact is that the foot washing service is clearly a requirement he who does not participate in the foot washing service is rejecting, rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and rejecting the higher cleansing. And I'm not prepared to do that. So from the evidences that we have looked at here in this study, we find that the Lord's Supper is only for those who have the unity of the faith. First, we must experience that oneness that Jesus prayed for, that they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee. If we strive for that unity of the faith, come to the foot of the cross, we will be brought to that unity, and then we can have truly have the Lord's Supper together. <laughs>